Do you ever get the feeling that instead of living your own life, you're just watching other people live theirs? Like you get this sense that there's something more you should be doing with your life, but you're not even sure what it is or where to start. It often seems like everybody else is accomplishing more than you, having more adventures than you, or they're all out living their best lives and yours is just sort of routine. Well, if you feel that way, you're not alone. Research is showing that living in our technologically advanced, hyper-connected world is contributing to this feeling in a lot of people. You spend your evenings or your downtime watching movies or shows on Netflix about people, places, and situations that you'll probably never encounter in real life. And you watch a reality show, which is the furthest thing away from your personal reality. You play video games where you take on this adventure, but you never even leave your chair. Or you spend hours of every day scrolling through your favorite social media apps, looking at pictures and videos of someone else's life. You're essentially watching people do life and then calling that a life. And listen, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm guilty of this too. I mean, it's no wonder a lot of us describe our lives as just routine. We feel stuck in a rut. We wind up doing most of our day without ever really thinking about it. And you're mostly doing things that get handed or assigned to you. You're not really deciding. You're just responding. You're doing what everyone else is doing without ever stopping to think, is this what I should be doing? Is this what my life is supposed to be? Or is there something else, something more? Well, throughout this video, that's what we want to explore together. Because here at Community Christian Anywhere, we believe that the God who created us has invited us into a kind of life where we thrive and we flourish as we follow Jesus' command to love everyone always. And that may sound too simple of an answer, especially if you're not sure that you buy into all this God and Jesus stuff. But I hope you'll stick around because I believe no matter who you are or what you believe, God has an incredible life in store for you. Because no matter what you think about God, I believe He can't stop thinking about you. He is for you and only has good things in mind for you. And throughout this video, we want to explore how to find all that God has in store for our lives. Hi, my name is Heidi and welcome to Community Christian Anywhere. Now, here are a few ways to know if you're stuck in a rut. You're stuck in a rut when pretty much every day feels the same. Your mentality is you're just gonna get through the day or get through the week, but there's no sense of purpose beyond that. You feel unmotivated about where you're headed or what you're doing. Maybe you even numb yourself with distractions because if you ever stopped and reflected on your life, you probably wouldn't like what you saw. You know you should probably change some things, but you feel like there's nothing you can do about it. You might even blame your circumstances or you blame other people for where you are in life. Until, until something comes along and it disrupts the rut. Something happens to you and it makes you ask yourself some hard questions. And in my experience, the disruptions, they're usually not pleasant. Most of the time, what breaks up the routine is some kind of tragedy or a crisis, and it wakes you up and you start to reevaluate life. For instance, your doctor says, I'm sorry, but I have some bad news. The person you love says, I'm leaving. Your boss says, we're letting you go. Or maybe you just hit your 30s or your 40s or your 50s. See, I had one of those disruptive moments a few years ago. It was probably the most spectacular and public failure of my life so far. 
I was put in charge of a really big task and it involved a lot of people. And the goal was to just help people and to serve our community. But before it was over, the entire thing had just fallen apart. People that I cared about were disappointed in me. Some were even angry with me. Friends that I thought would be in my life forever. They didn't even speak to me anymore. And it just felt like I'd wasted a lot of people's time and energy and nothing that I had ever hoped to accomplish even happened. So I started reevaluating everything. My role as a pastor, a husband, even a father. The disruption it was a pretty dark time for me. And it took a lot of time and prayer and even some therapy to wade through all of those emotions. Breaking out of that rut and routine was not a pleasant experience for me. But I can tell you, I think it's led me closer to the kind of life that Jesus was talking about in the Bible in John chapter 10. See, he said that he came to offer a life that is full and abundant, rich and satisfying. Now, when most of us see full and rich and satisfying, we immediately think, huh, convenient and comfortable. But a full life isn't always comfortable and convenient. See, comfortable and convenient, that's what leads you to the rut and routine kind of life that we just talked about. The full life Jesus was talking about looks more like an adventure. It looks challenging. Many times it even feels scary, risky. You know, one of the greatest lessons I learned from that dark and discouraging time in my life is that I had lived most of my life afraid to take risks. As a follower of Jesus, I wasn't created to live in the rut or play it safe or live in some mindless routine. I was made to live a full, abundant life of trusting God in every single moment, to join Him in what He's doing in this world. Now in this series, we've been exploring what is the way forward for us as a church in our time, in our community. And I'm convinced that our way forward involves each of us individually moving from rut and routine to risk, to move out of our comfort zone, out on the edge where it may seem hard and it may feel a little bit scary, but it's out there where God is working and where we get to join Him in what He's doing to bring hope and life and healing into our world. See, I see a lot of Christians who they are just content to read and study the stories in the Bible about the history of the church. But see, as followers of Jesus, we weren't called to read the history of the church. We were called to write it, to live it. We've been invited into the adventure, not to play it safe and do what everybody else is doing, not to do the same mindless routine every day, but to wake up every morning and say, God, I'm in for the adventure today. Lead me wherever you want me to go. Show me who you want me to love, who you want me to serve, and I'll join you in bringing your will, your life, your kingdom right here on earth, just as it is in heaven. See, that's a full and abundant life. That's not a life of rut and routine. That's the life of a Jesus follower. Now I want you to see an example of what this looks like from the earliest history of the church. We find this story in a book of the Bible that we call Acts. In the first century, uh, there was a doctor and a historian, his name was Luke, and he decided to write out a carefully researched document about the events that happened right after the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And he records the story of a man named Philip. Now, Philip starts out as a member of a team of people in charge of a food distribution program in the church in Jerusalem that was helping to feed disadvantaged widows in their city. But then this great persecution breaks out and all these Christians are forced to run for their lives and they flee Jerusalem. And Philip is one of them. So I guess you can say that his routine of distributing food, it's been turned upside down. And Luke in the book of Acts tells us that when Philip left Jerusalem, he went to a place called Samaria and he began spreading the word about Jesus and starting some churches there. Now, if you've read the stories about Jesus, you know that Samaria, it's a place that, well, most Jewish people like Philip, they avoided at all costs. See, there was this deep racial and religious hostility between Jews and Samaritans. If a Jew was traveling in those days, 
Even if it would save them days off their trip, they would intentionally walk out of their way to go around Samaria. But now, Philip is intentionally going into Samaria. He's loving these people, serving them, and bringing them into the growing church. So the question is, what changed? Well, the short answer is, Jesus is what changed. Jesus led his disciples into Samaria on several occasions. He interacted with Samaritans and treated them as equals. And so the early followers of Jesus began to realize that what Jesus had accomplished through his death and resurrection was intended to bring people of every nation and every ethnicity into one family. The walls of hostility, they've been torn down. And what once would have been considered the riskiest, most unheard of thing for a Jewish person to do a few months ago, it's now the very thing that Philip is doing. He's living the adventure of trusting God and following Jesus wherever he leads him to go. And we learn in Acts chapter eight that Philip is having so much success. I mean, people are turning to faith in Jesus and churches are starting all over Samaria. Things are going so well, they begin to send other disciples of Jesus, like Peter and John, to come in and to help out. And just when you think Philip would have begun to settle into this new role and enjoy the success that he's having, God reaches in and he disrupts Philip's routine one more time. He sends word to Philip through an angel, and he says, Philip, I want you to head south down this road that runs straight through the desert, and it goes all the way to Gaza. Now this road, literally leads into the middle of nowhere, out into this hot desert, almost completely out of the country, all the way into Egypt, where Philip had most likely never been before in his life. And God doesn't even tell him why he's going there. I mean, Philip has to be thinking, why in the world would I head out into the middle of a desert? I'm making a difference here. I'm, I'm seeing success here. I, I'm safe. I'm comfortable. It's easy. It's convenient. You see where this is going? See, the journey God is leading Philip on, it's not the way of comfort and convenience. It's the way of risk and adventure. He's calling him to do something that he's never done before. And the same is true for you and for me. God's plan for your life is to work through you, to impact the lives of those around you, wherever that might be. And God really does want to partner with you to do this. I mean, think about it. If God just wanted to get the job done, why wouldn't he have just sent the angel to do the job instead of sending the angel to tell Philip to go do the job? It would have probably been more efficient and a whole lot more impactful. But see, this is how God works. It's how he's always chosen to work. God invites people, ordinary, everyday people like you and like me, to join him in his work. So God calls Philip away from these crowds of people and this successful ministry he's built in Samaria out into the desert in the middle of nowhere. And you would think that the task would be something big and spectacular. I mean, why else would you send somebody all this way if it wasn't a pretty big deal? But what Philip soon finds out is that he's been called out onto this desert road to interact with one single solitary person. And throughout this video series, we've been saying our way forward as followers of Jesus and our way forward as a church is to do one-on-one -on -one acts of love and compassion wherever we find ourselves with whoever we are around. And God wants to use these simple acts to make a great impact on his world. So Philip heads out into the desert, not knowing where he's going or even why he's going there. And off in the distance, he spots a carriage heading south on the road. This carriage is part of a caravan and it's pretty clear that whoever's traveling in it must be pretty important and wealthy. And he was. He was actually the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. So this is definitely a guy with connections and power and money in one of the most prominent countries in Africa during that time in history. So God again speaks to Philip and he tells him to catch up to the carriage and just get close enough to walk beside it. So Philip does. And I'll bet what he experienced next just blew his mind. 
Philip hears this royal official from Ethiopia inside the carriage reading out loud. But he's reading from a book in the Old Testament in the Bible called Isaiah. And the section that he's reading is the most revealing direct prophecy about Jesus. It was written hundreds of years before Jesus, and yet it describes his crucifixion in detail, even though crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. It talks about how the Messiah would be mistreated and tortured and killed like a sacrifice on behalf of others. The scripture he's reading is one of the greatest proofs that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Philip sees his opportunity, and I think it probably started to become clear to him now why God had sent him down this hot desert road. So Philip asked the Ethiopian man, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I, unless I have somebody to explain it to me? And then he invites Philip to ride in the carriage with him. We don't know exactly what that conversation was, but the text tells us that Philip started with that passage and went on to explain the entire story of God's rescue plan for the whole world that was completed in Jesus. And the Ethiopian was obviously convinced to the point that he was ready to place his trust in Jesus and begin to follow him. Because the next thing we read is that all of a sudden, the caravan comes upon a body of water, which is probably pretty rare out in the desert. And the Ethiopian says to Philip, look, here's some water. Why can't I be baptized right now? In case you're not familiar with the significance of baptism, this is when a person is submerged into water and it's a testimony or a sign externally of what has taken place inside of someone who has chosen to follow Jesus. Baptism identifies you with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. When a person turns away from their old life, it's like who they used to be dies. And then they are buried in the water. But just like Jesus rose from the grave, the person is raised out of the water and their new eternal life begins. The life that Jesus made possible in His resurrection is now the life that we're living. Death and the grave have no power over us. That's what you're seeing when a person is baptized. And this is what Philip does for his new Ethiopian friend. They stop the caravan, they go down to the water, and he is baptized and his new eternal life of following and trusting Jesus begins in that moment. And as soon as the task is done, the text tells us that the Spirit of God snatched Philip away and he was gone. The Ethiopian never saw him again. Now, I know that sounds weird and I don't pretend to understand exactly what happened whether Philip just supernaturally disappeared and God took him somewhere else, or if he just left in a hurry. It really doesn't matter though. This part of his adventure that God had led him on was complete. And God had other risks he wanted Philip to take, other places he needed him to go, other people he was going to reach. And that's exactly what Philip did for the rest of his life. Now, let me see if I can make clear the answer to the question of why God has led Philip down this dusty desert road where he'd never been before. It's not recorded here in the Bible, probably because it hadn't happened yet when the book of Acts was written, but we know from history that the spread of Christianity and the birth of the church in Africa started in Ethiopia. Legend has it that this one Ethiopian official traveled back home with his newfound faith in Jesus, and he began to spread the word. He explained to his people what was explained to him, and people were reached, and they began putting their faith in Jesus. Churches were started, and Christianity began to spread from there all over the continent. In fact, today, one of the places on earth where the Christian faith is most prevalent is in Africa. But it all started with one man who was willing to allow God to break him out of his rut and routine to go to a place he'd never been before, a place that it really made no sense to go to, 
And Philip, he, he didn't even know exactly why he was leaving, remember? He just knew God had called him and that God was with him. And that was enough for Philip. He knew God would lead him and if he would just trust God, he'd wind up precisely where he was meant to be, doing exactly what his heavenly father wanted him to do. The rest of the adventure, it would take care of itself because Philip was being led by God. So I'll say it again, our way forward as a church, your way forward as a disciple, a follower of Jesus, is a life of one-on-one -on -one encounters with people who are loved by God, who've been created in His image, and your task is very simple. Love them, work for their good, serve them, encourage them, be curious about them, do for them what Jesus has done for you, and invite them into the new life, the kingdom of God, that Jesus says is available to everybody. Life forever in God's presence, His power, and His peace. But now, there's a warning attached to that. This life is not gonna follow the way of rut and routine. It's gonna involve some risk. And you're probably gonna feel scared a lot of the times. You may not even be exactly sure where you're going or what you're supposed to be doing when you get there. This way of life, it'll lead you away from comfort and convenience into adventure and challenge. But the good news is that your Heavenly Father, He's already there and He's leading you every step of the way. And ultimately, it's where you'll experience Him. You won't just learn about God or read some stories about what He's done in the world. You'll be writing the next chapter of the story. But the question for you is, what's holding you back from living that adventure? You know, I once heard the story of a man who took his son to the circus, and they were given a backstage pass to go and see all the animals up close before they performed. And as they were standing looking at the elephants, the man was just amazed. I mean, he'd never seen an elephant that close before, and it just blew him away at how big and strong and powerful they really were. But he noticed that the elephants were only being held in place by the tiniest little rope wrapped around their necks. I mean, if the elephants wanted to escape, all they had to do was pull on this tiny rope, and it would have easily snapped in two. So he asked the zookeepers why they didn't use anything stronger to restrain the elephants. I mean, weren't they scared that they would escape and run wild so easily? But the zookeeper explained to the man that when the elephants were young, and they were small, they were tied up with these same ropes. And they learn at a young age that they're not strong enough to break the rope. So over time, they just accept that the rope's too much for them. They can't pull against it and they eventually just give up. But even as they grow bigger and more powerful and they develop the strength to break the ropes, they don't even try. They just accept their situation and they surrender to it. And even though the ropes aren't holding them back, they're convinced that they are. And so they stay stuck there. For the elephants, it's no longer physical captivity. It's captivity of their mind. So here's my question for you. What are the ropes that hold you back? What keeps you from trusting God? What's holding you in a rut or a routine that's preventing you from going on an adventure with God? A life where you experience His work in the world, where you're partnering with Him to love and serve and bring about hope and healing. Maybe your rope is simply your own comfort. Life's gotten pretty predictable and manageable. It's safe. And there's not a lot of that fear that comes with taking risks. But are you really living the kind of life that Jesus said was full and abundant? Or maybe your rope is what other people have said about you. Maybe you're just convinced you're too unqualified or unskilled. God could never use someone like you. But now remember, Philip was just a guy handing out food before God sent him out on a desert road to go and start a movement that changed an entire continent. Or maybe your rope is a problem or a sin in your life that you can't seem to overcome. You know, God can work with that too. He's provided a community that you can belong to where our specialty is walking beside one another and working through whatever holds us back so that we can learn how to trust God and follow Him into the life He wants to give us.
God has a life of adventure and significance in store for you, but it will require you to take a step of risk out of your routine. And maybe after watching this video, you feel pulled towards taking a step towards God or the life that He has in store for you. Maybe, like the Ethiopian in our story today, you're just discovering who Jesus is. And your next step is to simply identify yourself with Him and signify that by being baptized. Or maybe you just wanna to talk to someone about what's going on in your life right now. Whatever you're feeling or thinking, even if it feels scary or risky, that's God through His Holy Spirit inviting you out of your rut and into His adventure. So can I ask you to take a risk and simply text the word risk to the number on the screen. Our speaker for today would love to talk with you and help you figure out what your next step is into the life that God has in store for you. But no matter what step you take today, I hope you leave knowing that no matter what you think about God, He can't stop thinking about you.